Coming up, I'll explore the significance of Biden's reference to Trump supporters as garbage. I want to commend the leadership of the RNC for being on top of the issue of election fraud. I'll explain. And journalist Mary Margaret Olihan joins me. We're going to talk about how Trump came to recognize the power of the trans issue for the 2024 election. Hey, if you're watching on Rumble or YouTube, listening on Apple, Google or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. <music> America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Guys, we are now just, uh, what, four days, honey, from the um, election. Well, it's getting very close, and the election is very close. I'll talk about some of those things in a moment. I thought I might begin with the biggest news of the day. This is, this is big. Get ready. Hold on to your seatbelts. Arnold Schwarzenegger is endorsing Kamala Harris. Now, um, if I were writing the headline for that, it would be something like Austrian weightlifter comes out for Kamala. Actually, former Austrian weightlifter comes out for Kamala Harris. I suppose it's not a big surprise. I'm not very good at Arnold imitations, but uh, here's, my, here's my version of why Arnold came to this momentous decision. Well, you know, she reminds me of one of my old dumbbells. I mean, I, that's as good a reason as any, right? She reminds me of a dumbbell. Excuse me, hold on. This is, this is happening during Arnold's press conference. Um, yes, yes. Consuela? No, no, no. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm coming. Hold on. Why don't you finish cleaning the bathroom? <laughs> Tabby's really enjoying this one. <laughs> but... Uh, let me return to uh, less significant news of the day, and um, and that is the um, that is Trump in a garbage truck. I mean, this is a stroke of genius because uh, you know the backstory to all this. It really all started with the comedian. I forget the guy's name, Hinchcliffe, or something like that. And he made a joke about Puerto Rico. Well, you know, it's a floating island of garbage. Comedians do this kind of stuff. The, the joke wasn't all that good. And it, it looked like the left was on the verge of trying to make it a, a talking point against Trump. Namely, he's making fun of Puerto Rico. He thinks all Puerto Ricans are garbage. And then who should come along but uh, Joe Biden and his walker and uh, and Joe Biden takes the exact garbage line and, and uh, in a way takes it into a new dimension by saying, no, it's Trump supporters who are garbage, which is by and large half the country. Now, the Democrats have been trying to kind of walk that back, particularly because Trump is making sufficient inroads into the Democrats and independents that they need to make equivalent inroads into Republicans in order to make this election competitive or to have a chance of, of winning. And uh, so they can't afford to have Biden saying this, even though when Kamala Harris was asked, I mean, here's something ironic. Apparently, the Democrats think it's not a good idea to refer to Trump supporters as garbage, but it's okay to refer to them as Nazis. So Nazism, that's all right. Calling him garbage. Well, that's we need to we need to walk that one back. And so here was Morning Joe this morning. He's like, well, Joe Biden made a slip and quickly corrected himself. Well, he didn't really make a slip. He said what he meant. And I think what he meant to say is that that the real garbage is the Trump people, not just Trump, but the people who like Trump. 
And um, so I think I think Biden was being honest yesterday. I kind of joked that Biden was doing this to spite Kamala Harris. This is sort of giving Biden too much credit that Biden is strategic enough to realize, listen, five days before the election, I'll pull the rug out and, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll watch the, you know, I'll watch the uh, I'll watch the Indian hit the floor, bab, and, and I'll pretend like I didn't know what was going on. I don't even know where I am. I mean, this is the uh, this is the good old uh, reminds me of the anecdote where one of my fellow Dartmouth students asked Richard Nixon how Reagan was able to get away with the Iran-Contra scandal, but he, Nixon, was not able to get away with Watergate. And Nixon goes, that's because he could say he was stupid. This was Nixon, of course, being kind of malevolent against Reagan. But, of course, Biden has the same excuse. Well, I can always say I was stupid. And everybody, of course, agrees. Why else is he not on the ticket? Kamala has been going around saying, no, no, Biden's really with it. His brain is completely intact. The neurons are really firing. He's sharp as ever. Well, of course, the natural follow-up to that is, well, in that case, why are you the nominee and not, and not him? I, um, I am feeling pretty good as we go into Tuesday. Obviously, we all are nervous about election issues, stopping the count, last-minute shenanigans. I mean, the memories of 2020 are have not only not gone away, they're quite vivid in many of our of our minds. But that being said, I will say that I think the RNC is much more on it. I mean, do you imagine the old days of the RNC under that corpulent Rona McDaniel, where they would do nothing, collect all this money, waste it, uh, and um, and claim they would raise money on election fraud and do nothing about election fraud? Now, I'm sure that that place is still somewhat infested. I mean, it's not easy to clean up the place. Uh, and the RNC seems to need the same kind of fumigation as some of our federal agencies. But nevertheless, there is new leadership, Michael Watley from North Carolina and, of course, Laura Trump. And I noticed that when there are issues around the country, there was one, for example, where I saw a report about Michigan, and it seemed to suggest that there were duplicate ballots, a large number of them in Michigan. And uh, it was a little bit of here we go again. And, and the report seemed quite credible. But right away, the RNC was on it. And I saw Laura Trump did a clarification. Hey, listen, there were some of these duplicate ballots, but there is... But the RNC is on top of it, and none of these so-called duplicate ballots are going to be counted. There was some sort of a glitch, but the glitch is being addressed, and we don't have to worry about fake votes being, being counted. Um, similarly, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, apparently they stopped people from early voting at like 3 o'clock or 2.45 in the afternoon. And there's a video of this cop walking around and basically puts a, the line ends here, 2.45. It's not even close to 5 p.m. And so what does the Republican National Committee do? They go to court and they put it before a judge and say this is, and then apparently the way this was done is the Democrats send out their own operatives uh, who were, who had a sort of name tag that said something like vote checker or voting supervisor. It was all bogus. These were, these were not county officials, but apparently they looked like they were an authority. They were democratic activists. And these are the ones who were able to tell the police to stop the count, to stop the vote, to, to end the early voting early, because of course the Republican numbers were looking so good. But the good news is that they have now been penalized for that and the judge in Bucks County has extended early voting by three days. Three more days of early voting. Very good for us. So this is a good example of taking a, what normally, if this had happened in 2020, uh, you know, Rona McDaniel would be sitting on the top of her sacred pillar, uh, chant chanting Om, <laughs> and her, uh, the Republican attorneys would all be having their three martini lunches, spending all the donor money. But now it's in court. It's in court immediately. And, and this is the way you fight election uh, hassles and election fraud is you attack it at the source and you do it before the election. Um, Debbie and I have had this conversation and she's like, look, you know, we we don't want to be in a replay of 2020. We really won the election, even though the count came out your way to be able to go back and undo things 
is just a lot, lot harder. It's not impossible. It has been done. It hasn't been done at the presidential level, but it has been done at the congressional level. But it's not something that you want to look forward to. By and large, you could say the odds are against you. The guy who go, who gets the numbers across the finish line has the presumptive advantage. And uh, and as we know, judges are somewhat reluctant to get involved in the in the muck of the uh, of the electoral process. I was looking at the the poly market betting numbers this morning on the way to the podcast, and uh, I noticed that um, there's only one of the swing states where Trump is losing the betting, and not by much. Um, Forty six to fifty three, I think, in Michigan. But uh, Trump is winning everywhere else. And in places like Arizona and Georgia, the betting money, now this is the betting money, this is not the polls, but the betting money by and large has been more reliable than polls. One reason I'm actually giving at least equivalent weight to these two separate ways of calling the election is that if you just look historically, the betting markets are better, not just in calling elections, they're better in calling anything. Who do you think is gonna win the Super Bowl? Um, or any particular game. Is it going to be the is it going to be the Red Sox or is it going to be the Dodgers? Okay, the betting markets are a much better way than if you go take a poll of fans. See well, who because the fans are going to go. Well, what happens with fans is that they confuse who they want to win with who is going to win. And by the way, this is a very natural temptation. It's kind of like imagine if I were to go around and say, you know, in two thousand eight. Barack Obama is going to win the 2008 election. People go, how can you say that? I thought you were a Republican. I'm like, I am a Republican. Yeah, but you just said you thought Obama's going to win. Yeah, but I'm not talking about who I want to win or who I voted for. I'm talking about who is going to win. So an objective look subtracts away from what you what you want to happen. Yeah, Debbie betted me and won $1,000. Uh, on the, the because she said Biden would win in 2020. Of course, uh, I was tempted to come back and say, no, well, Trump really won and so on. But no, this was this was one of those objective who's going to end up in the White House bets. And um, and uh, we I think we joked that we have a similar bet going on. I think it's really comes down to our, our temperament, which is a little different. We we're actually very close in our assessment of the situation. Uh, but I think that um, we both think that if first of all, we both think that if it was a fair media, it would be a landslide for Trump. We both think that Trump is probably going to win straight out. I probably agree with Debbie that Trump is not going to win the popular vote. I think that the popular vote is going to go with with Kamala Harris. And that's only because of the the, the flooding of votes and, and, and not to mention probably a lot of illegal votes that are going to be happening in places like California, maybe even in New York. Uh, but um but we differ on who's going to make it. Who's going to who's going to occupy the White House in, on January twentieth of of twenty twenty five? We both want it to be Trump, and let's hope that we're right. I want to talk to you about balance of nature, but let's start talking about being unbalanced. We're officially in the time of the year where eating becomes off balance. Parties, holidays, family gatherings always mean more snacks, more sweets generally indulging in the wrong food. So when your eating habits go off balance, so can you. That's why I strongly recommend Balance of Nature, fruits and veggies in a capsule. These are the daily supplements. The fruit and veggie supplements are sourced from whole fruit and vegetable ingredients, all the things you may be missing, all the things you need to make up for being off balance during the eating season. Make sure you get more of a variety of fruit and vegetable ingredients every step of the way with Balance of Nature. Start a trend toward better health today with my special startup offer. Whether you order online or call direct, you got to use promo code AMERICA. You get 35% off plus free shipping and a money-back guarantee. Here's the number to call, 800-246-8751. Again, 800-246-8751. Or go to balanceofnature.com. When you use discount code AMERICA, you get 35% off, you get free shipping, and also a money-back guarantee. Can you imagine your child being lost or alone in the woods for nine days? There's a new movie. It's called Lost on a Mountain in Maine, produced by Sylvester Stallone. It's the inspiring true story of 12-year-old Don Fendler, separated from his family in a fast-moving storm, lost in the remote wilderness of northern Maine. For nine days, he fights to stay alive with no food and no proper clothing. He didn't even know the danger he was in. Hey, as a parent, 
this would be one of my worst nightmares. So Dawn's disappearance captured national headlines, sparking a massive search effort with hundreds of volunteers, including his own father, who was afraid he'd never see his son again. Don't miss the inspirational family adventure film of the year, Lost on a Mountain in Maine, from Blue Fox Entertainment. It's coming to theaters nationwide on November 1st. Get tickets online at Lost on a Mountain in Maine movie. Dot com. That's lost on a mountain in Maine movie dot com. Guys, I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast Mary Margaret Olahan. She's senior reporter for the Daily Wire. The website is dailywire.com. Uh, you can follow her on X at Mary Marge, M A R G O L O H A N. She's also the author of D Trans True Stories of Escaping the Gender Ideology Cult. Mary Margaret, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, I am looking at an article that you just published. Uh, pretty fascinating. How Trump learned to embrace the transgender culture wars. And uh, we've seen Trump now at the rallies go into this issue. And we've got to remember that it's a new issue. And that if we go back to 2020... I don't really think Trump talked about this issue at all. Uh, the issue perhaps was not even on the forefront. And this is the point of your article to, to trace and to track how this trans issue um, not only came to the forefront, but came to be seen as a political winner for Republicans and conservatives. And Trump, with his instinct, recognizes this, and he's now all over it. And you argue that it could be a pretty important issue going into the final outcome next uh, Tuesday. So let's begin by talking about how the issue... I mean, tell the story about how this issue even got... Um, became noticed in the first place. Well, thanks so much for having me, Dinesh. This is a story we broke at the Daily Wire yesterday morning, and I, I also think it's very interesting. We spoke with more than a dozen activists and operatives close to Trump who told us that, like you're saying, this wasn't an issue four years ago, but the events of the past four years, including the Loudoun County sexual assault scandal and Glenn Youngkin's win in Virginia, uh, the rise of parents after they saw what their kids were exposed to during the current coronavirus pandemic and the rise of Riley Gaines really helped Republicans and Trump understand that not only is this a big issue, but it's a big issue that resonates with American voters and it's something that Trump wanted to be at the front of. So we started by tracing back to the beginning of this period where I should note that there were a lot of conservatives who were sounding the alarm on this, but their concerns were not always taken seriously by Republicans uh, for a variety of reasons. And I think one of them was that a lot of Republicans were afraid um, after the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, a lot of Republicans were afraid to be associated with anything anti-gay or you know, the, the claim that they were being homophobic. Uh, and so they stayed away from these types of issues. Whereas there were people, especially like the women at Concerned Women for America, or you got people like Ryan Anderson at the Ethics and Public Policy Center who were saying, pay attention, these issues are not going away, they're coming for our kids. And a lot of people were afraid to address these issues, but unfortunately, these types of commentators were correct. Uh, now we are in fact seeing Democrats and far left groups advocating for transitioning children, uh, for allowing men and women spaces, uh, and for many more far left policies that American voters don't support. Uh, and we started seeing these policies creeping up around maybe a decade or so ago, but they weren't really in the mainstream media for a while or even in conservative media. So around 2020, when the coronavirus pandemic hit, all of a sudden parents were able to see for themselves what kind of materials were being pushed on their kids in the classroom. And of course, Dinesh, Dinesh we both know what a lot of those things were. Uh, pornographic materials, books on um, men having relationships with young boys, uh, critical race theory, gender ideology, pushing children to transition, all of these things. And parents, when their kids were at home uh, doing virtual learning, had the ability to see into the classroom and understand what was going on, and they were horrified. Uh, they were absolutely outraged and they rose up and i don't even think it's dramatic to say that right these parents they 
they armed themselves and they educated themselves uh, with the appropriate materials from activist groups like Parents Defending Education. Uh, and they talked to these different groups, they got the materials from the schools and sent them to reporters like myself uh, and to Luke Rosiak here at the Daily Wire. And in turn, reporters and commentators like yourself would just talk about these things and help the world to understand that no, it's not a conspiracy theory, this is actually happening. And I think conservative media really helped in that regard because when there actually were links to stories that, that Republicans could talk about, they became a lot more comfortable discussing the issue and putting out releases and putting out statements and talking about it on air because they had evidence that things were going on. And so that kind of evolution began around 2021. Do you think that, um, that, you know, when I think back to the, to the gay issue and gay marriage in particular, it seems like this is a battle that the left began 20 years prior. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, Ellen comes out of the closet and, you know, Will and Grace and 4,000 sitcoms uh, and, and conservatives were just sort of resting on the fact that, well, we're kind of all against gay marriage, but we're not going to really say anything about it. And then suddenly we woke up and realized that the issue is lost and, uh, and it's lost in an almost irrecoverable way because you now have an affirmation of a kind of um, uh, universal or at least national right to, to gay marriage. Do you think that we've learned that this stuff incubates uh, is then pushed very uh, covertly through schools, education materials, in some cases in the media, and that if you want to challenge it, it needs to be challenged right away and up front. And as you say, parents discovered this is going on and they began to speak out. The second factor I think that seems to be critical and like you to comment on this is that it's one thing to say that, you know, two adults should be able to, you know, live together and transfer the inheritance of one to the other. It's a whole other thing to say that you got you get to um, uh, you get to inflict this kind of ideology on children, let alone change their bodies in ways that may be difficult, if not impossible, to change back, or at least without very serious medical and psychological consequences. Do you think that these are these have been two key factors in conservatives being a little more? vigilant on this issue than they have proven to be on the gay issue in general? I don't know if Republicans have learned their lesson on this, um, because I think one thing I heard consistently from people who um, advise former President Donald Trump or close to the campaign is that when it comes to this issue, like you're saying, um, most Americans believe that adults have the ability to do what they want, but you shouldn't be pushing this type of thing on children. And, you know, as I was sharing, people like Terry Schilling and others were, have been on top of this issue for a while, um, but they had to try really hard to get this kind of messaging to permeate uh, the Republican Party or, you know, the Trump campaign to help people understand what was going on here. Uh, so I'm not sure if, <laughs> I'm not totally sure if Republicans have learned their lesson, but I do think they understand right now how important this issue is to Americans. Uh, one Republican ad or Trump campaign advisor that I spoke to said, you know, this this issue, like I was saying before, a lot of people used to be afraid to message on it. But there's a acknowledgement that the LGBTQ movement has not it has strayed away from the messaging of the past 10 years. Uh, now it is a party of pro transitioning children. It is a movement that is pro transitioning children. And there are not a lot of people who want to get behind that. In the, and in the Republican Party, there's an acknowledgement that that's a political loser. And I think there's an acknowledgement that it's a political winner to be on the side of parents and children. And Glenn Youngkin's victory in Virginia was a really good example of that. I want to come back in the next segment and talk about Riley Gaines and talk about um, the impact of that, um, about her ascent and her involvement in this issue. But before I do, it seems to me a little bit odd that the gay, the LGBTQ movement decided to make the trans issue their vanguard issue. And I say that because, I mean, I'm not surprised that they're always pushing the envelope to like the next most radical thing. There seems to be a natural tendency in that direction. But in some ways, the trans issue is a repudiation of the argument that they had been making for 30 years on the gay issue. If I remember, the argument on the gay issue was always something like this. I don't know, Dinesha, I'm not saying it's nature or I'm not saying it's nurture, but 
It's me. Uh, I don't have a choice in the matter. I wish I wasn't gay. If I had an option and could check a box and not be gay, I would do that. But since I don't have that choice, what are you, what kind of life are you offering me? You just want me to ultimately just suppress the way that I am and, and live this kind of self-mutilated life? Or, in other words, the gay argument was always based on the idea that these people don't have a choice in being what they are. And then along come the trans people and they go, well, it's ultimately a matter of choice. It's ultimately, it's ultimately how you identify that counts and not somehow what you are intrinsically. Isn't there some kind of a grotesque contradiction here? And how come this hasn't really bothered the activists of the LGBTQ camp? Well, there are many contradictions present in the gender movement. And when it comes to gender ideology, I think we have seen over and over that science and facts and uh, our previous statements are not always what matters and what does seem to matter, for example, when it comes to the Biden administration's handling of gender ideology is what is most politically expedient or what will confirm the going narrative. Uh, so, for example, we found out last week that there was a doctor who purposefully didn't share results of how puberty blockers and so-called gender affirming hormones affect children um, because she didn't want to have to contradict the going narrative on gender ideology. Uh, so this is very common. This is how these activists utilize their, their messaging and uh, they're, they're not interested in the truth and they are interested in pushing this ideology no matter how many children they harm. We'll be right back with Mary Margaret Olhan. We're talking about her article, How Trump Learned to Embrace the Transgender Culture Wars. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the increasing cost of health insurance? Have you had enough of not having control over your health care dollars? Introducing ShareRight, it's healthcare done the right way. At ShareRight, you're not just a number, you're part of a caring community. Forget about paying excessive premiums. With ShareRight, you stand to save 30 to 50% compared to health insurance. Think about what you could do with all those savings. But it's more than just savings. ShareRight ensures you have access to the care you deserve precisely when you need it. From routine checkups to unexpected emergencies with ShareRight, your healthcare is there top priority. Empower yourself today by taking control of your health care costs. Visit ShareRight.org slash Dinesh to learn more. See how much you can save. Visit ShareRight.org slash Dinesh. That's ShareRight.org slash Dinesh for health care done the right way. Mike Lindell has a heart of gold. Mike and MyPillow love giving back to those in need. They sent a truckload of 14,000 MyPillows to those impacted by Hurricane Helene. But even though he loves to give back, a large retail store just canceled a huge order that had already left the warehouse. So besides giving to those in need, Mike wants to pass some big savings directly on to you. For the first time ever, you can get a standard classic MyPillow for wholesale prices, just $14.88. It gets better. For a limited time, they're offering the entire classic collection at wholesale prices. Get queen size my pillows, just $18.88. Upgrade to a king for only a dollar more. Get the body pillows for $29.88. Multi use my pillows, just $9.88. Here's the number to call, 800-876-0227, or go to MyPillow.com. Use promo code Dinesh to take advantage of wholesale pricing for the first time ever. On top of that, get free shipping on orders over $75. These prices have never been low this low before. Again, the number to call, 800-876-0227, or go to MyPillow.com. Don't forget to use the promo code Dinesh. You'll get the standard MyPillow, just $14.88, the lowest price ever. There are limited quantities at this price, and once they're gone, they're gone. I'm back with uh, writer and author Mary Margaret Olihan. Her book, Detrans, True Stories of Escaping the Gender Ideology Cult. Follow her on X, Mary Marge, M-A-R-G, Olihan. Um, you mentioned at the end of the last segment a prominent scholar who is, um, has done a study looking at the effect of these puberty blockers on minors and, and, and just... Let's contemplate the scandal of what's going on, because what she's saying is the result is that these things are harmful. In other words, what we, the gender ideologues and the gender um, professionals are doing is we have been harming people. However, we can't put out the message that we've been harming people, because if we do, it may inhibit our ability to continue harming them. 
I mean, that appears to be the clear implication of what's going on here. Uh, we can call it protecting a narrative, but it's actually much more insidious than that. It is refusing to allow new information and valid information. She's not saying the study was flawed. She's involved in the study. She's saying that uh, we have to suppress the truth itself. And I, I highlight this because very often on all these issues, you know, if you go to the people over at YouTube or Google or Facebook, they talk about the fact that it's really important in an age of social media to suppress misinformation. And I think we've realized that on critical issues, what is being suppressed is not misinformation. They're suppressing the truth itself because the truth right. is injurious to their ideological narrative. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when it comes to this topic, what we should be doing is actually researching these topics and finding concrete evidence and then maybe issuing our statements and press releases on what we've found. But instead, people like this this doctor, I don't even want to call her a doctor, this, this activist, uh, what they're doing is they're trying to find ways to push their already preformed ideological narrative. And that's all based on the claim that if kids can't get so-called gender affirming care, they will kill themselves. And that claim is based on faulty activist studies as well, which are is repeatedly being uh, disproven in recent days. But that claim is what you'll hear them talking about when they say that they need more studies to show that it's true. Well, they do because it's such a bogus claim that they do need more stuff to back it up. I recently investigated a doctor who uh, said that even though she knew that puberty blockers were breaking down the bone density of kids, the dangers of ruining kids' bone density, it doesn't matter because the dangers of these kids allegedly killing themselves because they couldn't get hormones were higher. And it just, it doesn't track. So these doctors, they're not above changing science to fit their narrative. And apparently, as in this case, they're not above hiding the actual data to prove their own narrative, or as you call it, their their agenda and their their more insidious purpose. Let's come back to Trump and the transgender culture wars. The It seems like... Uh, a significant factor here has been the public activism of young Riley Gaines. And again, when she first, you know, I, I remember when she was competing against uh, Leah Thomas, I think is the transgender athlete. There was, um, it took a lot of guts to, you know, to, to, to question the process. Uh, but that is yeah. one thing. It seems like she went to a whole different level where she basically goes, listen, I'm going to like, now devote some years of my life to this. I'm going to try to bring other athletes on board. I'm going to encourage women not to compete in competitions where you've got biological men. Um, and the, her, the boldness with which she has done this, I think, has been an inspiration to a lot of people because, I mean, it, it has been very strange how, uh, by and large, before Riley Gaines, there seemed to have been a sullen silence among female athletes where they had been, I mean, bullied is perhaps not too strong a word, into submission, like this is the way things are, don't you dare raise a question about it, because uh, if you do, you're the one who's going to be labeled, labeled a bigot. Right. Well, I was at the NCAAs in 2022 when Riley, Gase, Riley raced Leah Thomas or Will Thomas, the male athlete, and I was in the stands watching and I remember I was going through the list of all the girls on the heat list and I found her name and I saw University of T Kentucky and I thought, I bet she'll talk to me because she's from Kentucky, so maybe she's more likely to be willing to speak her mind. And sure enough, she did get back to me and I was able to break her story at Daily Wire and show Riley speaking out for the first time about how uh, unfair the situation was and how they gave Thomas the trophy instead of her and sent her home without one. And it's been so amazing to watch how her rhetoric has progressively grown more confident and more strong and just very truthful and fearless, honestly, even though she's faced har harassment and violence. And she's even been held hostage by protesters at a university on one occasion. And you're right, she's, she's testified at the state and the national level. She's a guest on some of the most major podcasts in the world, uh, and her testimony is supported by uh, former President Donald Trump, and she's endorsed him for president. And I would say she's becoming almost a household name, which is crazy when you realize that only two years ago, she was a college student racing a male and having a male in her locker room. 
Uh, so she she's massively impacted this discourse. Um, and I think she's really helped a lot of other girls to speak up as well and to say, no, no we're not going to tolerate this. Uh, and she teamed up with IWF um, and, and really gathered together a circle of other girls who are willing to speak out on this as well, like Paula Scanlon, who is Leah Thomas's former teammate. Uh, so she's massively contributed to this and she's been at rallies with former President Donald Trump recently as well. Uh, and I think she'll say herself that she thinks this is an issue that people are going to come out for and they're going to come to the polls for. And actually, Dinesh, one person I talked to told me that this is going to be a women's issue um, and, that, and that their polling indicated that more women are going to come out for this issue than we might expect. It seems that the lesson of the article, when we think about the the parents in Loudoun County, Virginia, when we think about the parents who were uh, who had their eyes open during COVID, when we think about Riley Gaines, I think the lesson here appears to be that in a lot of these issues, the it's not the political leadership that comes up with these issues and goes, hey, this is going to be, this one's really going to resonate, but rather you have grassroots people who often at considerable sacrifice and cost to themselves because, I mean, let's think about it. These parents, you know, might find themselves under FBI surveillance. Uh, in some cases, they run the risk of being sued. Oh, you're, you know, you're, you're committing a hate crime. You know, so they, they create a certain legal vulnerability. With somebody like Riley Gaines, she's, you know, a successful athlete. She's popular. She's enjoying her private life. Suddenly, she becomes this radioactive symbol. I'm sure she's, people have said all kinds of horrible things about her. And so... It takes a lot of, of uh, courage at the local level, people who are, who you know, don't have the resources, let's say, of Trump um, or Elon Musk, for that matter, but who put themselves on the line, they take up the issue, and then what you're showing, I think, in the article is that this issue has percolated upward so that ultimately the, the, uh, the Trump people and the Republican leadership have looked at it and gone, well, you know what, this actually could be a winner for us. Yes, exactly. And I think that would not have happened without uh, conservative media, conservative commentators making the issue louder without these parents on the ground pushing the issue, giving conservative media all this inside information from the schools, taking videos, sending documents, recording what's going on. And then also without people like groups like Concerned Women for America or American Principles Project, leaders who are constantly trying to tell Trump, this is what's going on. This is what people care about. Don't just listen to your DC consultants. Pay attention to us. We're on the ground. We know what's going on. Um, and that really permeated uh, the Trump campaign. And that's what advisors told me. And it was able to reach Trump. Uh, one thing we included in the story was how Terry Schilling literally brought his polling to Mar-a-Lago and showed it to Trump in person and said, this is what American voters are interested in. And he said that when he showed that polling to Trump, he was surprised to hear how educated Trump was on it and how much he understood the issue. So uh, I think it's very interesting. I think heading into next, next week, it will be fascinating to see how this issue uh, plays out. I have a feeling that there are going to be a lot more people heading to the polls on this issue than we might expect. Wall Street Journal calls it the 2024 sleeper issue. And um, that's definitely the point we were making in this story as well. And maybe a final point to close out on is the fact that, you know, we are in a new environment where these cultural issues are, they're, they're in the forefront, for one. Uh, and we also have a candidate that's not afraid to jump on them because I can fully see if I mean, just flashing back to Romney, uh, for example, in 2012 or even earlier to McCain, that there would be, I think, quite a likely chance, even if you went to them with the exact same data, that they would say, no, this is not an issue that we really want to talk about. We're really running this election because of tax rates and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, there's been a general, even though the cultural conservatives might well be the majority in the Republican Party, they have been perhaps the most ignored group in the Republican Party right. until Trump. I, I completely agree with that. And as a culture reporter who's been covering these issues for the past six years, I saw at the beginning of the time as uh, the beginning of my time as a writer, I could see how no one wanted to engage with these issues. I tried so hard to get different lawmakers to comment on stories that I'd be working on where, you know, it wasn't like in inappropriate sex education popped up immediately in 2021. It was happening for a long time. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Everyone really stayed away from these culture issues, except when the March for Life rolled around, they'd all introduce their legislation that would fail. 
uh, to protect babies and then they would forget about it for the rest of the year. And now I, I do think we've seen a little bit of a change in how it comes to culture issues. Republicans understand that these are huge shift changing uh, messaging issues. In Alaska and Texas, we've seen two major Democrats flip flop on men and women's sports in the last week. Uh, we reported that Mary Patola in Alaska was advocating for men and women's spaces. You know, she had voted for the Equality Act. And then after we reported on this, lo and behold, she tells everyone, I don't support men and women's sports. So they understand it's not polling well. They understand it's a political loser. Uh, and I'm surprised we haven't seen more Democrats flip on this. But uh, maybe we will if the election proves me right and and more people come out for this issue than we expected. I think we'll see a lot of Democrats start to pull away from this messaging because it's too radical for Americans. I mean, I remember somebody uh, put the question to Kamala Harris. Uh, hey, uh, you know, do you think it's a good idea to pay for these trans surgeries? And, and she ran away from the issue. I mean, she quick. I mean, she runs away from a lot of stuff, but she ran away from this issue along with with the other issues. Guys, I've been talking to Mary Margaret Olhan, senior reporter for The Daily Wire. Check out her article, How Trump Learned to Embrace the Transgender Culture Wars. Also her book, D-Trans, True Stories of Escaping the Gender Ideology Cult. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Guys, I'd like to invite you to check out my Locals channel and consider becoming an annual subscriber. I post a lot of exclusive content there, including content that's censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday. Debbie occasionally joins me. No topic is off limits. I've also got a movie page up at Locals with some very cool films, documentaries, feature films, both mine and also films by other producers. 2000 and Mules is up there, the film that came out last year, Police State, and of course you know about the new film, Vindicating Trump. If you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch this movie content for free. It's included with your subscription. So check out the channel. It's Dinesh.locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.locals.com. I'm discussing my book, The Big Lie, now out in paperback, and I urge you to grab a copy. It's available on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, and this way you can read. There's a lot in the book, and while I'm going to cover a lot, it this is one of those books that you'll come out knowing a whole lot more than you went in. There's just a lot of detail in the book. That will, that's ammunition. It's intellectual ammunition for you. And it takes on the arguments of the other side at a, at a sophisticated level. Now, I started by introducing this concept of the left playing the fascism card and, and, and using the Freudian idea of transference to, to blame fascism on the right. And... Um, and before I get into it, I, I make the point in the introduction to the book that, that this has happened before. This is not the first time we've seen transference. The left is doing the, the fascism transference, but before that, they did the racism transference. They played the race card. And, um, and um, the race card preceded the fascism card. In fact, I was on to the race card at the very beginning, but I, I was not on to the fascism card at the very beginning. I remember years ago, I saw an article, um, actually in the Washington Post, I'm going to read the headline, Reagan still sure some in New Deal espoused fascism. I saw this article. And I remember at the time thinking like, what's he talking about? Um, in other words, at the time I read this article, I was captive to the big lie. I had bought into the idea that there was extremism on the left and on the right. At the far extreme on the left is communism. At the far extreme on the right is fascism. This is what I had read. This is what I had heard. This is what I had been taught. And little did I know that this whole framework was a post-war scam or scheme, intellectual scheme, developed by people who wanted to cover up the tracks of fascism and its close ties to, to the left. So when I first read this about Reagan, and Re what Reagan knew, and, and Reagan knew because, let's remember, Reagan's dad worked in the New Deal. Reagan was very close to the New Deal. Reagan was born, I believe, 1911. 
So Reagan was an, a young man in his late teens, early 20s during the New Deal, and he saw it up close. So he knew that there was a fascist imprint. In fact, people in the New Deal were openly praising fascism. We'll learn a lot more about this later. The ways in which FDR's brain trust were admirers of Mussolini. They made trips to Rome to study fascism. They brought back fascist ideas that they would happily and excitedly tell the American press about. All of this has been swept under the rug. You won't see a lot about it if you see anything about it at all in textbooks uh, today. So... But even though I was not glued into the fascism card, the fascism transference, I was kind of clued into the racism uh, transference. Now, even here, by and large, conservatives and Republicans have been a little bit on the wrong track. And what I mean by that is that in the America of the 80s and 90s, the America of Reagan uh, and even the Clinton years, the America of the old National Review, National Review is a kind of a very pallid version of what it used to be under under Bill Buckley. But the old National Review adopted a very, in my view, strange approach to, to racism, but one that at the time I was very much influenced by because, of course, I was one of those kind of young uh, disciples, if you will, of National Review. And uh, my mentor, Professor Hart, was part of the National Review circle. And National Review would adopt what I would call the racial minimization strategy, which is, no, America's not so racist after all. Stop exaggerating. Or, alternatively, well, yes, America used to be very racist, but guess what? We've made a lot of progress since then, and we, should, we don't need to keep emphasizing racism because that was in the past, and things are a lot better now. Now, these are not in and of themselves invalid, but politically, you have to say they're not too effective. You're up against the wall. You're on the defense. We're not as racist as you say. We used to be, but we're not anymore. Well, um, the strategy that early on I kind of glimpsed and then grabbed onto, and this was the strategy that I took up in the early 2000s, but certainly with the early films like America, and then, of course, even more so with Hillary's America, was essentially different from the racial minimization strategy. It's not, we're not as racist as you think. It is that, listen, there was a lot of racism in America, and there still is. And guess what? Pretty much all of it comes from the Democrats. They were the party of racism. They still are the party of racism. Their racism may have taken on a new uh, configuration or a different form, but it's ultimately racism aimed at the same goal, the same end. And yet they accuse us of racism. So here we go. This is transference. This is them blaming us. Even when you hear about all these things about the big switch, the big switch is kind of a way of saying, we're now going to make you take responsibility for what we did. The big switch is a way of saying that, you know, I used to live in this house, I, the Democrat, and I murdered 25 people in this house, and you lived across the street, but we've now switched houses. I bought your house, you bought my house, so you're now to blame for killing those 25 people. What? How? You did it. So all of this stuff, the Democrats engaging in this attempt to lift the blame off of their own shoulders and, and pin it on to us. Now, you might wonder, how do you get away with this? Like, how can you pull off a, and it is a big lie, how do you pull off a big lie about racism that is so big, where it's not only, you're not only falsely accusing someone, it's one thing to go up to some guy and go, you're a child molester, and it's false, right? That's ugly enough to do. But can you imagine a child molester doing it? In other words, the guy who's actually guilty is accusing the guy who's being innocent of the things that the guilty guy did. That's what the Democrat, how do you pull off this kind of a lie? Well, I think the answer is you try to control the levers of information. And for the Democrats, these levers are three, academia, the media, and the entertainment industry. Because those are the three places where people get information. You get ideas and information in entertainment. You watch movies and you're like, oh yeah, this, is the, this was the USGIs defeating the Nazis from the old war movies. This is the Cowboys versus the Indians. We often miss that we pick up so many ideas about American history from these fictional 
portraits. And then, of course, you have academia where you've got things that are taught to you, and they're taught to you, and you often think that, oh, gosh, you know, when I'm reading a history book, that's the way things happened. But we've got to realize, no, you, we've got to learn to be skeptical about this kind of thing. Why? Let's think about it. How, how does history get to be objective? There are two possibilities. Either the historian was there, and frankly, if the historian was there, let's just say a historian was there at the French Revolution, was there uh, during the Civil War, by and large, the people who were there were on one side or the other side. So they're not objective. They're participants in the events. They have their own uh, preferences, biases, choices, ideological compasses that they're bringing to it. So where's the question of objectivity? But then you say, well, no, maybe the, the historian comes a lot later. He wasn't there. He, he's detached from these events, and so we can expect a certain amount of objectivity. And my question is, how? If you weren't there, how did you learn about the event? Answer, well, I looked at the journals of the soldiers who were in the Civil War. Exactly. So if you weren't there, you're getting information from the people who were there, who were biased, who themselves had a stake in the outcome, who themselves were fighting for one on one side or the other side. They're the ones who are trying to persuade you or cajole you or tell you what happened. The point is, there is simply no way, either if you were there and and thus involved or not there and getting your information from people who were either way history is going to have a spin and so i'm not even really faulting the left for putting a spin i'm simply telling you that their spin is deceptive uh they put in a spin and that's to be expected but the spin is misleading it's misleading both on the race issue and it's misleading also on the fascism issue so we'll pick this up um, and talk more about it, but I'll just sum up by saying that the race card is no less misleading, no less deceptive than the fascism card. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.